Hey everybody, Christopher Odd here. Welcome back to The Witcher. Uh, this episode is going to be a little bit different. Uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go through a bunch of the stuff that's in my journal that's kind of building up. We have some really interesting character backgrounds I want to check out, read about some uh, some of the different locations, go through the glossary, the monsters. Uh, not so much formulas and ingredients, but what I'm going to do is I'll put a, uh, a comment below with timestamps, so if you want to jump around from quests to characters, whatever, if there's something you're more interested in, go ahead and click on that and it will link you to the right part of the video. Uh, but I think this is a good opportunity to figure out more about the world that's unfolding around us. Because there's, in the first chapter there, a lot of things were flying at us and it was hard for me personally to take everything in. So, I'm going to go through all of this stuff with you guys, and if you have any questions or additional things you want to see or expand it on, uh, let me know. Also, you guys, a lot of you are experts at this game, so uh, if there's any clarifications that you'd like to make, then let me know, uh, and I will try to incorporate that going forward. So, first things first, just a quick recap of the different quests that we have. Uh, we have to go through the game of dice, which... I missed out on the first chapter because I never went back to the inn before uh, I progressed. And you know what, at the end of the day, I wish I would have gone back, but I kind of dig that the whole choices thing really does have an impact. So I have to go and I have to figure out uh, this game of dice. I played it with the elf earlier, but now I have to go and tell the Zoltan guy about it. I guess I can meet him at the next inn, a couple people were saying. Uh, Berengar's secret, we learned about him at the very beginning. He's kind of like this rogue witcher, I guess, that has left. Uh, the guards got their hand on a witcher's sword. It probably belonged to Berengar. I need to talk to the to the fence who owns the place where the sword was found. Strange, but I found myself following in the footsteps of this mysterious witcher. I doubt he would ever part with his sword voluntarily, so he may be in trouble again. And we keep hearing about Berengar as we are progressing. Uh, it's kind of interesting. We do seem to be following in the same path, so we want to find out more about him. Memory of a blade. Jethro spilt the beans. He said they found the silver sword at Taylor's place or Tyler's place. Uh, I wonder where the fence got it from. I need to visit him as soon as this business is over. So, <laughs> the two guards were kind of hesitant to talk about where the sword came from, but then uh, Jethro, kind of a, a little bit of a goofy guy, he kind of screwed up and said, look, we got it. Thaler's place. So. Prison break. I've decided to team up with Siegfried. This is the guy in the sewers that we met. I'll be easier to fight together. Apart from that, I will gain the order's gratitude. I must find the cockatrice's nest in the sewers and kill it. I must find the cockatrice and blah, blah, blah. Say, slay the creature. So I, I decided, look, Siegfried's going to be here to basically be a distraction. <laughs> I'm going to try to use him as bait and take down this cockatrice when we find it. Uh, wanted. I found an arrest warrant for the professor, the man responsible for the assault on Kaer Morhen for Leo's death. If the professor is a wanted man, Salamander must have enemies. Any enemy of my enemy is my friend. I should only talk, or I should talk to the city guards in Vizima, see if they can't help me contact the professor's foes. And we actually saw the professor in the prison that we were just in he was being released so that's pretty bizarre and then witcher secrets i interrogated the leader of the gang from the outskirts and gained some new information the man mentioned someone named azar javed i should remember that alvin said the bandits often mention vizima so that is where the trail leads okay so those are all of the different quests that we currently have going through our characters there are a ton some of them will probably have lengthier descriptions than others, but I'm going to go through them because I think it's important uh, to really understand all these different people that we've already come into contact with. So first of all, we have Abigail, and I totally gave her the D. <laughs> oh, God, you guys, it's for science. Like, I swear to God, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I tried to explain this to my, to my wife the other day about this game, and she's like, so you bang chicks? She's like, how many chicks have you banged? I'm like, I think three? I think two is it two or three maybe just th maybe just two because there was uh the girl at the very beginning tris and abigail and i can't remember if there was another one i can't remember anyways doesn't matter 
Uh, a witch named Abigail lives in a village in the outskirts. Though the villagers buy herbs and potions from her, she also faces much hostility, as we witnessed. The Reverend informed the congregation that Abigail has uttered the curse of the Hellhound, that the witch was surrounded by an angry mob. I decided that she didn't deserve to die and saved her from being lynched. Abigail left the outskirts for good. So she's gone. Uh, this little heart, you know what that means. Okay, that's cool. So now we'll find out if there were others. <laughs> I don't know how I can't remember that. But uh, that's why I'm saying there was no passion involved. It was just a thing. It just it happened once and that was it. Alvin is this little boy that we've seen a couple of times. Uh, a boy named Alvin managed to escape the Bargast attack, which cost his foster mother her life. As a result of the shock, he started to divine the future and uttered the prophecy of Ithlin. I suppose Alvin is a source. He has magical powers he cannot control, and we've seen that. Alvin lived with Abigail until the witch gave the boy to the reverend. The preacher gave the orphan to a group of salamandra thugs who demanded that the dwellers of the outskirts surrender their children. I killed the bandits and I saved Alvin. So, good thing for us. I'm not sure how he's going to tie into this, but he's been a pretty major part here. Oh yeah, Azar Javed, he is the mage that attacked Kaer Morhen in order to steal the Witcher's secrets hidden in the fortress. Okay, so this is like that big beasty mage that we saw at the very beginning, and he kind of fled through this portal uh, while the professor was there, just as we got to our lab in Kaer Morhen. One of the leaders of the forces that attacked Kaer Morhen was a mage so powerful that even Triss Marigold cannot oppose him. The organization that he leads uses the symbol of the Salamander. So he is like, he is the leader according to this. The mysterious mage using the Salamander symbol is a skilled alchemist who is researching mutation. The mysterious mage is Azar Javed, an exotic name suggesting that he comes from a distant place. The mage is in hiding, yet his influence extends over the whole of Vizima and possibly beyond. So I imagine at some point we're going to come face to face with this dude. And that references a quest from back here. Where is it? Uh, right here. I interrogated the leader of the gang from the outskirts and, and gained some new information. The m man mentioned someone named Azar Javed. And that's now a reference back to who he is. Now, Berengar, look at this. He's in the shadows and everything. Uh, Vesemir mentioned a witcher who had left Kaer Morhen before my arrival. His name is Berengar. Berengar was seen in the outskirts earlier. He agreed to kill the beast, but then disappeared. Did he fear facing the monster? We're not sure what happened to him. And I'm not sure how he filters into our story quite yet, but we'll find out. Eskel is the calm and reasonable witcher from Kaer Morhen, and he is my peer. Wonder how he got that disfiguring scar. We don't really know much more about him at this point. Heron Brog is a suspicious character who fears only the Reverend. He sneers at the law in surrounding himself with thugs who, thugs who protect his shady dealings. Brog lives in the outskirts in a little lakeside settlement that he, that he rules outright. He never strays far from his home. He does run a store trading in weapons and alchemical ingredients used to produce bombs. He's also done dealings with some sketchy folk, so he is kind of not to be trusted anymore. Uh, we have Jethro. He's a guard in the city dungeon. We just met him. He would merely be a standard smartass, except that he's addicted to Fistic. I don't know what that is. Uh, do we have anything about Fistic in here? No, we don't. But uh, that'll be interesting. I don't know if that's like, must be some type of drug or, or something. Kalkstein is this crazy weird alchemist guy. Uh, this absent-minded alchemist seems nice, but it is obvious that scientific theories are of greater concern to him than the more prosaic aspects of life. So, typical science guy, like, just totally self-involved. He kind of, in a weird way, reminds me, from the limited interaction I've had with him, of uh, Walter from uh, Fringe. If you guys don't know what that is, you should, you should check it out. It's a TV show. Lambert, uh, the young witcher I met at Kaer Morhen, sure has a biting tongue. He's rude, especially to Triss Marigold, so I don't know why that is. Uh, and he addresses her by her last name. No respect for her at all. And I'm not sure what's driving that, but I'm sure we'll find out. Leo, unfortunately, he is the youngest of Kaer Morhen's residents. He's not a full witcher, though he has completed his training. He was not subjected to mutation. Leo comes across as a hot-headed whelp but is also kind-hearted and good. It appears that Leo is somewhat fascinated with me. He has heard the ballads about the White Wolf 
and he now holds me in high regard. Unfortunately, he was killed by the Professor, one of the leaders of the assault on Kaer Morhen. The boy was too hasty and inexperienced. I was not able to help him, even though I was right beside him. I don't know if there was a way to ever save him. That would be interesting. Uh, but I do not believe that we could, so... Let me know. Uh, Mikul, he is widely respected because he's become a city guard, and that's quite a career for someone from the outskirts. He seems lazy and lecherous. He cares little about the problems of the outskirts and tends only to his interests. By day, Mikul stands guard at the gate to Vizima. And if I'm not mistaken, he and maybe some of the other guards raped potentially his wife or girlfriend or something like that. I'm not sure exactly, but there's some type of weird situation with Mikul or Mikul. I think. Uh, Odo, he's the big drunk. Uh, the wealthiest person in the outskirts is a grim drunkard who inherited a fortune from his brother. Odo is distrustful and stingy. He lives at the end of the village in a house surrounded by a fence with a high gate. And I believe that he killed his brother. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, evidence pieces that point to that. And I believe, uh, I'm hesitant to give a name here, but I think it was Rosen who told me in a comment that... Uh, we could overhear somebody talking about Odo at one point, and he was asking for information on how to kill a warrior. So all signs po point to Odo murdering his brother and inheriting his fortune. Then we have the Professor. One of the leaders of the Salamandra attack in Kaer Morhen was a man called the Professor, who seemed to be a cunning assassin. The other leader was a mage, that's Azar Javed. It turned out that the assault in Kaer Morhen was not the Professor's first foul deed. The arrest warrant shows clearly that my opponent is a wanted man. The Professor was released from the dungeon right in front of my eyes. He mocked the law and proved to me just how powerful Salamandra is. We have the Reverend, this dude. Don't get me started. Uh, the leader of the community in the outskirts is a domineering priest of the eternal fire called the Reverend. His authority reaches well beyond the realm of the spiritual. People from the town and village in the outskirts do exactly what he says. Almost blindly, I'd say. The Reverend is a religious fanatic and a hypocrite. He easily finds guilt where it doesn't exist, ignoring real offenses. The Reverend lives in the town just left of the temple. During the day, he either prays or tends to the church. The witch Abigail was probably gone by the time I arrived at the Reverend's. Irreconcilable differences is all I can call it. We argued and I had to kill the priest. He is no more. I'm happy about it. This guy was a total... He was weird and he sent Alvin to the Salamandra. Like, it's just a... No. I do not... I'm not a fan of him and I will no longer be seeing him, so that's good. Uh, Shani, soon as I arrived at the outskirts, I met Shani, an acquaintance from a long time ago in quite dramatic circumstances. Shani is completely devoted to medicine, which is her passion, and she had plenty to do in the outskirts, so there was no time for small talk. I got the impression that this sensible, intelligent girl likes me a lot. I dragged Shani into the business with Salamandra, and although the girl was in danger, it all ended well. Shani finished what she had to do in the outskirts and returned to Vizima to her house in the temple quarter. Cool. And she, uh, like, so, as it says, she um, has returned to Vizima, so we will no doubt run into her again. Siegfried, we literally just met. He is Siegfried of Denel, if I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, a knight of the Order of the Flaming Rose. He's an idealist who adheres to the Order's rules, but is not devoid of common sense. Polite and open, he is unlike many of his brothers from the Order in that he is not prejudiced. He is undeniably courageous and, dis and demonstrated this when he descended alone into the sewers to fight the cockatrice. So, all signs point to us being able to trust this guy. I keep referring to him as my bait for this cockatrice. Uh, that being said, like I still don't want him to die because I want to gain his trust because I could potentially use him and the support from this order down the road. So I don't intend for him to die, but you know, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Tris Marigold, uh, I don't have her, I don't have the little heart here for some reason, but you know what, things did happen between us. That I know. Uh, along with me and the other witchers, Triss fought in the defense of Kaer Morhen. The sorceress stood against the mysterious mage, one of the leaders of the assault. She was injured and lost consciousness. Ironically, Triss is allergic to magic, and she can only be administered natural healing potions. Okay, I didn't catch that earlier, so that's really interesting. Triss Marigold is my friend. She saw me die, and my return to the world of the living surprised her. Triss is a sorceress, one of the most influential and talented of her kind. She has numerous powerful friends, and she knows the Kaer Morhen Witchers. She is one of the few people who know the way of the fortress. I have a feeling Triss likes me a lot. I have a feeling these chicks dig the Witcher. 
After Leo's funeral, the sorceress teleported to Vizima. So we'll run into her soon, I'm sure. She decided to use her extensive contacts and search for information on the Salamandra. Triss promised to find me as soon as I arrive in Vizima. So as soon as we get there, we should see Triss, which uh, I'm definitely excited about. Now, Vesemir, uh, I would say kind of my mentor, in a sense. Vesemir is the oldest and most experienced Witcher, possibly older than Kaer Morhen itself. I don't know if Witchers live to be, like, eternal life or what the situation is there. Uh, he does spend each winter in the fortress and sets off on the road when spring comes, just like all the others. Despite his age, Vesemir is robust and lively. Many youngsters could envy him his health. An excellent fencer, he was the one who taught me swordsmanship. He has raised many witchers, including me. His disciples treat him like a father. Leo was probably the, the old witcher's last protege. The boy's death really shocked him. He was one of the few to survive the assault in Kaer Morhen. He is well aware of the magnitude of the hatred some people feel for witchers. Vesna, she is a barmaid from the tavern in the outskirts. Vesna is quite a determined girl. She sells food and alcohol. And I think we might have hooked up with her. Did we not? No, you know what? I think she just looks like Abigail a lot. Maybe we didn't. I think she may be the one that uh, that we escorted to her house. And everyone's like, oh, you should have, you know, you know, slipped it in there. But I didn't. Vincent Mees, the captain of the city guard, released the professor, one of the most wanted criminals in Temeria, so maybe he's in on it. Vincent is the captain of the city guard and the main executor of the king's law in the temple quarter. So he's got a lot of power, this guy. Then we've got Zoltan Shive. I helped a dwarf being attacked by racists. He recognized me as an old friend of his. The dwarf's name is Zoltan Shive. He claims to be witnessed... He claims to have witnessed my death years ago in Rivia. Zoltan seems reasonable and pragmatic. He talks the... He t takes the world with a grain of salt and sees irony in most things. Just like other non-humans, he also seems vexed by the racist atmosphere in Temeria. So I have to talk to him about this dice game. That's been uh, a quest that I've had for quite some time. Now to go through some of these locations, uh, there is this old crypt in the outskirts and I wish I would have explored it a bit more. Nobody really gave me clarification, but... Uh, it would have been good to know if I could have used the Ard sign to blast down some walls or something. Uh, it has not been used for some time. People are afraid to enter it because of the monsters that dwell there. I pretty much cleared it out. Rumor has it that treasure is hidden inside the crypt. See? The truth is that people of old were buried there with valuable items. Sometimes the graves of the wealthy were separated from the remainder of the crypt by an additional wall for fear of robbery. Frick. I wonder if I'm ever going to get to go back there. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Huh. I don't know. Let me know if that's an area I'm going to get to go back to at some point. Uh, the dungeon is where those criminals unluckily, unlucky enough to fall into the hands of the city guard are kept. That was like the prison. Prison turnover in the jail is relatively high. Some are released, usually to return after a while, just like most prisons. While others are executed on the scaffold. Captain Vincent Mees of the City Guard is the jail's warden. The dungeon affords access to the sewers, which run under the entire city of Vizima. The inn, oh god, I'm going to hear lots about this, but the inn in the outskirts uh, was established to cater to the needs of travelers and merchants headed for Vizima. The owner has surrounded it with a high palisade. Although the inn doesn't feature extravagant comforts, it is a safe place to spend the night and eat a meal. Uh, the innkeeper also offers a wide selection of alcohol. It is a favorite meeting place for the inhabitants of the outskirts, so there's always someone to talk or dice with. Care Morhen, pretty self-explanatory. We you definitely should know what that is. Uh, it's Inaccessible Mountain Stronghold, which has been the headquarters of the Witcher's Guild for centuries. And some say, obviously, that... Uh, what's his name here? Uh, Vesemir is older than that, so that's pretty crazy if you think about it. The name comes from the language of the elves, the original Care... Amirhen translates into Old Sea Fortress. The castle's time of greatness has passed, the battlements and moat have deteriorated, and a cold wind blows through the spacious halls. Currently, only a handful of witchers live here, but once many young boys underwent gruesome training along the famous Gauntlet. Huh, near Kaer Morhen. Cool. 
The laboratory is obviously under Kaer Morhen. Famous Witcher Laboratory holds the most closely guarded secrets of the cased mutagenic plants, hallucinogenic mushrooms, natural stimulants, and potion ingredients. It is here that young apprentices were subjected to the incredible incredibly painful trial of the grasses, which only a few survived, gaining superhuman abilities in return. Then we have the sewers, which is where we are now. Uh, not much of their original greatness remains, but they still serve their function well, connecting the temple quarter and the trade quarter. They often carry sewage for the entire city, rendering the stench of the cutters a little less overbearing. The sewers have recently become infested with monsters, especially drowners. Apparently a cockatrice also made its lair here. Now, Tamiria, this is, from what I understand, the kind of, uh, not continent, maybe country you could compare it to. Uh, or a state, maybe, with multiple cities inside of it. Tamiria's population is not exclusively human. It also includes dwarves, elves, gnomes, and dryads. After the devastating war with Nilf Nilfgaard, many areas are haunted by monsters, which have hitherto... Hitherto, <laughs> Shit. which have hitherto not constituted a serious threat, while the realm's roads are made unsafe by outlaws and common bandits. As a result, the witchers, the witcher profession is once again in demand, though people continue to treat witchers with caution and disdain, often calling them mutants and freaks. The kingdom of Temeria has silver lilies on a black background as its emblem. This powerful country has gained even more influence in recent years under the wise rule of King Foltest. Across the Pontar River, the kingdom borders Redania. To the south and east, it is hemmed in by mountain ranges, including Makaham, and the mainstay of dwarves and gnomes, past which lie the lands of Lyria and Adrian. The capital of Temeria is Vizima, lying on the shore of Lake Vizima. Of Lake Vizima. Okay. The second largest city is Maribor. Temeria mints its own coin, the Orin. That's the currency here. The most widespread religions are the cult of Melitil and the belief in the eternal fire, which obviously the Reverend represented. Temeria is home to the headquarters and many commanderies of the Order of the Flaming Rose. And then we have the outskirts, which is where we started this journey. Like any large city, Vizima also has its outskirts. Near the city walls stand the houses of townspeople who could not afford to live in the city or could not stand the stench of its gutters. A little further out, among fields and meadows, peasants have their thatched roofed homes. Unfortunately, the hard times have left their mark on the outskirts. Many homes or houses are vacant, their owners killed in the war, slain by monsters, or taken by the plague which ravages the area. Okay, so now we've gone through all of the locations. We have a good grip on where we're at. I'm going to quickly run through the, uh, uh, the monsters. I'm not going to read all of the, um, all of the details. I don't think. There's a whole bunch of monsters here. I'm trying to decide what would be important to cover. Really, um, this kind of stuff I think is important. But this is kind of interesting too. You know what, I'm going to just cover off what I think is interesting. You guys, I mean, feel free to skip it if you want. But uh, I'm going to I'm gonna try to, to go through this and find out what's interesting. So this Cockatrice, he's susceptible, he's sensitive to silver, which is good because we now have the silver sword. Uh, his tactics, he will try to surprise his opponent, striking suddenly and poison him with his venom. venom. Uh, alchemy, toxin, Cockatrice, eyes, and feathers are things that we can uh, gather from him to use for alchemy. I believe that's what that means. It's got a high resistance to poison, uh, difficult to knock down. Cockatrices are born of eggs laid by roosters consorting with other roosters. Weird. The egg must be incubated for 44 days by a toad, which is devoured by the little beast as soon as it hatches. A cockatrice hates everything that lives so fiercely that its glance turns the living to stone. Only a bold adventurer with a mirror can deflect its deadly gaze and defeat the cockatrice. Okay, well, I don't know if I qualify as living. I'm not sure how I, where I fall in that compendium, but uh, he could definitely freeze Sebastian or whatever his name is here, Siegfried. <laughs> so that's something we're gonna have to watch out for. Uh, these dogs are just, I mean, they're regular dogs. 
Whoever claims a dog is man's best friend has probably never tamed a wyvern. Don't know what that means. <laughs> Spectral of fear. The Bargus, these are like these demon hounds. Uh, they are fearless and cannot be poisoned. They are sensitive to silver and very susceptible to knockdown attempts. The fast owl is most efficient against Bargus. People say that Bargus are specters. Oh, okay. We've seen something, uh, some type of oil that we can coat our blades with that, that is, does more damage against specters. And I wasn't sure what those are. That must be this kind of overarching uh, classification for some of these monsters. They try to surround their opponent and work as a group. According to some folk tales, these monsters are the scouts of the wild hunt. Other legends say the ghost appears as a sign of divine retribution and embody revenge. However, all tales agree on one point. Bargus show the living no mercy. The Bludzigr is a grotesque monster from the swamps, causes terror among peasants because it, it pours digestive juices over their wounds of those who are still alive and then dines on their half-digested intestines. Sensitive to silver and fire again, a strong style is recommended. I don't think we fought one of these, have we? I don't believe we have. I think we just learned about this from something that we read or some type of um, ability that we gained. Uh, the Drowned Dead are, are uh, immune to bleeding, binding, and poison attempts. Uh, they are immune to stun attempts and the Axie sign. That's interesting. Sensitive to silver, obviously, as most monsters are. Particularly strong and dangerous drowners are... These are, like, the strongest of the drowners, I guess. Are known as the Drowned Dead. Simple people see no difference between the drowner and the Drowned Dead. Encountering either of them is equally deadly. Okay. We might suppose, though, that the most gloomy legends concern the Drowned Dead rather than Drowners. Okay, interesting. And then you've got the regular Drowners. They are scoundrels who ended their wicked lives in the water, drowned alive, or thrown into deep water after death. They turn into vengeful characters, or creatures, sorry, which stalk the inhabitants of coastal settlements. Then we've got the Frightener, which we... Well, I didn't fight it. I could have. But I decided to help Trist instead at the very beginning at Kar Morhen. Uh, frighteners are very rare. They come into being as a result of magical experiments. To create a Frightener, a mage has to possess great power and a basic knowledge of mutation. And I believe... Who was it? It was either that bald mage or Azar Javid himself who brought this guy in. I think it was the other mage, though. Uh, the first mage ever, though, to create a Frightener was the infamous renegade Dagobart Sula, a diligent student of the Zurichanian Masters of Alchemy, and the supervisor of the Trial of Grasses carried out at Kaer Morhen. Upon beholding the abomination he created, Sulla is said to have said, What have I done? He destroyed the monster. His notes, however, survived, and obviously, somebody else found those. Then we have these ghouls, which we found in the crypt, I believe. They're sensitive to silver and necrophage oil. Ghouls are said to have been humans who were once forced into cannibalism, and after many years spent in dark crypts, underwent a horrifying transformation. Only human flesh can satisfy their eternal hunger, so they kill people and store the remains in the recesses of their lairs. No thanks. The Gravier appears wherever they can find food, preferably human corpses, but any carcass will do. They're immune to common poisons. They're sensitive to silver. Crazy. After the war with Nilfgaard, graviers became a real plague. Until then, the monsters were familiar only to specialists and professional beast killers. Thus, everyone mistook them for ghouls. Today, any child could give an accurate description of the graveyard. And people who have passed near battlefields or necropolises... Necropolises? Offer <laughs> first-hand accounts of the horrible murders committed by these ruthless necrophages. And then you've got wolves. Susceptible to knockdown attempts, wolves attacking groups, beast fangs, and beast livers from these guys. There was so much snow that winter, that winter, uh, that we had to dig tunnels just to get to the privy and had icicles in our pants by the time we got back. Wolves came out of the forest, ate the cattle, and then surrounded the house. They were howling madly, surrounded by that pack of wolves. We felt like three little pigs. Cool. So those are all the monsters. I like that they put so much detail into all these things. Like, I just think that's so rad. So based on certain areas that you're going into, or if you want to stop and say, okay, well, what was it about these ghouls they had to do? You can come in here, you can check out what they're susceptible to. That is awesome. That is very, very cool. 
last but not least, we've got the glossary, which is going to be more about the different factions and uh, additional substances. So let's get into these, and this will be the final thing that we review in our journal. So, additional substances. An alchemical ingredient can contain one of three additional substances, albedo, negrito, or rubdo. And we've seen that when we do the alchemy. If all the ingredients chosen for the creation of a potion have identical additional substances, the resulting potion will provide additional benefits beyond its basic effect. Albedo potions characterized by a lower level of toxicity. Negrito potions affect coordination and concentration, increasing damage inflicted on opponents. And Rubido potions, aside from the potion's primary effect, uh, it also regenerates lost vitality. Okay, so Albedo... Uh, creates lower levels of toxicity. Negrito is for damage. And Rubido uh, is for regenerating vitality. I'm not going to remember that probably. But uh, if you guys could think of a cool way to remember that, that would be great. If you're still watching this, let me know. The secret word is White Wolf. If you're still watching this 30 minutes in, type in White Wolf and I'm going to be your biggest fan. <laughs> Uh, Catriona, a disease which quickly spread through all the northern countries after the war with Nilfgaard. Those who suffer from Catriona die a terrible death. Their convulsions become stronger every day. They vomit blood and mucus and have bloody diarrhea after a fortnight or so they die in agony. No thanks. Cult of the Eternal Fire. Worshippers of the Eternal Fire believe in the undying flame as a symbol of survival and a guide through darkness. They view it as a harbinger of progress and better days to come. Clerics of the Eternal Fire oversee the faithful as well as their temples where they burn flames continuously. The Order of the Flaming Rose is the cult militant arm. Okay. So you have these Eternal Fire guys, right? And they're kind of like, they're looking at this thing as, how can I, I'm trying to sum this up in, in easier terms. They're looking at this eternal fire as a symbol of survival, right? So they're they're looking at this as they're worshiping it, basically. And the Order of the Flaming Rose is the cult militant arm. If somebody could summarize this for me in a better way, I would love that. And I'll be your biggest fan also. Then we have dwarves. They are shorter than humans, but tougher and more muscular. Male dwarves wear long beards. They're usually gruff, but can be merry, and are renowned for their stubbornness. Considering excellent... Considered excellent craftsmen and warriors, many have earned grudging acceptance in human society. Still, it is not uncommon for young dwarves to join the Scoia'tael rebels to fight for more rights for non-humans and an end to persecution. And I believe that our friend, uh, what is his name again? Zoltan Shive. I believe he is part of the Scoia'tael. Dwarves are one of the elder races. They were once a dominant race, along with the elves, but now their sole enclave is Mahakim, a mountain city rich in metal and mineral deposits. Of all the elder races, the dwarves have assimilated best and many now live in human cities. They run businesses and off are often wealthy, although they meet with disdain and distrust. During the war with Nilfgaard, dwarves made a name for themselves as mercenaries although many of them also fought in Scoia'tael commando units against the Northern Kingdoms. Very cool. Then we've got the Elves. After Gnomes, Elves are the eldest race on the continents. Okay, so Gnomes are the oldest. That's cool. I wonder why, though. Well, I guess we'll find out. Uh, they created a magnificent civilization and the greatest human cities, like Vizima and Oxenfurt, were built upon Elven ruins. Oh, I see what that's saying. The greatest human cities, like Vizima and Oxford, were built upon elven ruins. Elves also have a special affinity for magic, although their magic is different from that of humans. Elves are long-lived, yet the reproductive cycle of their lives ends quite early, and moreover, they reproduce much more slowly than humans. This is why they were defeated, the reason why they lost their preeminence in the world. Today, only two enclaves of the race remain. The Blue Mountains, where the elves suffer privatization, and are dying out. And then you have the Dol Blathana, the Valley of the Flowers, which is ruled by the sorceress Enid Angliana. The Valley of the Flowers is a dependency of Nilfgaard. OK. 
Okay. Elves are a beautiful and long-lived race. They have pointed ears, sharp features, and possess no canine teeth. Elves are arrogant and proud, and over many centuries, they have developed a high and sophisticated culture. Few remain today, however. Few... <laughs> It's hard to, to read this blindly, I should say. Few remain today, however. <laughs> I'm still saying it wrong. Few remain today. Few remain today, however. <laughs> and these are in constant conflict with human civilization. That is why so many young elves, eager to fight for their rights, join Scoia'tael commando units. I always thought the elves were the coolest, like in Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. If I could be any one of these type of creatures, I would almost always, always be an, an elf. I just think they're so cool. Then you have gnomes. It appears we don't know a lot about them. Gnomes are secretive and mysterious. Most of them live in Mahakam and are allied with the dwarves. They seldom interact with humans. Gnomes are talented craftsmen, miners, and inventors. Their technology is superior to that of humans, and gnome weapons can be equaled by no others. They are also considered the eldest race on the continent. Ithlin's Prophecy. An old elven prophecy about the end of the world, the wolf's blizzard approaches, the time of the sword and axe, the time of the white frost and the white light, the time of madness and disdain, Ted Derad, the final age. The world would perish amidst ice and be reborn with the new sun, reborn of the elder blood of Hen Ikar, of a planted seed, a seed that will not sprout but burst into flames. Ithlin, an elven prophetess, is famous for her foretelling of the end of the world. According to her prophecy, the world will be destroyed by an ice age and all humans will die. The only survivors will be elves, saved by an offspring of the elder blood, known also as the Swallow. That's interesting. Why would only the elves survive? Whatever, Ithlin could believe whatever she wants. Uh, several signs will herald the destruction of the world and the cataclysm will begin when elven blood soaks the earth. So a big elven death, I guess. This will mark the advent of the time of disdain, the axe, and the wolf's blizzard. People call me the white wolf. I wonder if I'm going to have a part in that. Which can be interpreted as a long war or a return to barbarism. Mages. Only rare individuals have the potential to become mages, and many of those with this potential are doomed to madness. Unless the individual in question, also known as a source, Alvin, haha, learns to control their power quickly, he or she may end up a half-insane, slobbering oracle. So I wonder if Alvin is going to become a mage. Interesting. That is why schools of sorcery were created, where talented children study for many years, acquiring knowledge and mastering magical skills. Because of their powers, mages age more slowly than ordinary people. They can extract magical energy from the four elements, transport themselves long distances, and heal as well as kill in the blink of an eye. They have extensive scientific and political knowledge. In the latter respect, many mages are the equals of rulers. Okay, cool. And then magic, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but we'll go through it. Magic is the art of bending the power of chaos to one's will. Practitioners of the art must master a vast and complicated corpus of knowledge, and it seems women have a special predisposition for it. Interesting. Maybe that's why Triss is so strong. Sorcerers seek out talented children and teach them. The power bound in spell formulae may be used for healing, teleportation, destruction, creating illusions, and altering form. The most famous spells are named after their creators, for example, Alzur's Thunder or Marigold's Hailstrom. Thanks to magic, it is also possible to create magical glyphs and amulets, such as the Witcher's Medallions. The Witcher's signs are very simple spells, mostly kinetic or mind-influencing. So we're on like a lower kind of level than mages, I guess, magic-wise. To use them, one needs concentrated will and a hand gesture. Casting signs is not time-consuming, so Witchers use them when fighting monsters. Medicine for centuries. Diseases have plagued mankind, yet when Jan Becker su uh, subjected the power to his will, people gained a powerful weapon in their fight against disease. Mages study bacteria and viruses, the way germs spread as well as genetics. Their research is used by medics who set up hospitals and produce increasingly effective medicines. They also... They are also magical potions there are also magical potions capable of healing wounds and internal injuries. Many magic users such as Marty Sodergren or Vicenna have become healers, traveling the world and using their magic for the good of others. 
Now learning a little bit more about the Order of the Flaming Rose, they were established after the war with Nilfgaard by a charismatic leader, Jacques de Aldersberg, on the foundations of the deteriorating Order of the White Rose. Okay, so these guys are like, not descendants, but they kind of came from the Order of the White Rose. Uh, de Aldersberg's aim was to protect the people from monsters and other evils and to promote belief in the eternal fire. The Order's headquarters are located in Vizima, with numerous commanderies spread across the whole of Temeria. And that references back here to the Cult of the Eternal Fire. The Scoia'tael are a group of elven and dwarven rebels fighting against the discrimination of non-humans. They are divided into commando groups or, uh, or independent squads. Their protest against racism quickly turned to violence. Scoia'tael rob merchant caravans, plunder and burn villages, and kill. Instead of finding a peaceful solution, humans send troops to fight them. Scoia'tael means squirrel in elven, or Scoia'tael means squirrel in elven, and the name probably comes from the rebels' habit of attaching squirrel tails to their clothing. Now, my opinion, and it's just based on not a lot of details, I actually, like, I support the Scoia'tael's, um motives like i really do they're they want to uh stop discrimination against non-humans but just the way they go about it is not like it doesn't seem like it's the right way and humans then send troops to fight them and it's just kind of that whole war causes war thing so hopefully we get a chance to kind of like make friends with them and perhaps try to change their ways that would be cool and then last but not least, we finally have the Witchers. Mutagens and magic render Witchers' bodies resistant to all kinds of disease, even to the point of outright immunity. Due to their otherness, unusual abilities, and magic skills, Witchers are treated as outcasts and sometimes even met, met, are even met, it should be, with hatred. This hatred was made manifest during the infamous attack on Kaer Morhen, which led to the destruction of the fortress and the death of most of the witchers wintering there. Those who survived are doomed to extinction since they no longer train successors. Interesting. So I, that attack on Kaer Morhen, that set up like this whole thing? That's interesting. People need witchers but are simultaneously afraid of them. The, the itinerant warriors inspire fear because they are mutants and have superhuman powers. A witcher is rarely a welcome guest, and contacts with members of this profession are almost always limited to business, i.e. slay these monsters for me. Witchers are invariably attacked during pogroms and social upheavals direct directed against those who deal in magic. Very cool. Okay, well, that is the end. We've gone through the whole journal. I just want to say thank you guys so much for the support in this series. It's such an old game. But you know what? I I don't know why I missed it. I say that about almost every game that I play, but you guys really enhanced the experience for me. I just, I, I am so overwhelmed by the amount of support you guys gave me, and I'm, I'm super grateful for that. That being said, I've been talking for literally almost 45 minutes straight here. And, uh, wow. I've learned a lot. This is really cool. I'm super happy that I made this episode. Some of you guys are going to be like, oh, no gameplay. But this is great. I love this stuff. And I'm going to end the video here. Thank you guys so much. And I'll talk to you next time. Geralt out.